could somebody chime in? Are you able to see the screen share? I just got an error message from Zoom. Can you see it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Welcome everyone. Um, if you are just joining us, please put your name and your organization in the chat and your response to the icebreaker. What's your favorite vacation spot? I went to Portland, Oregon this summer for the first time. It was delightful. Quirky city, lots of good food. <laughs> That's all I need. Ooh, Belize. Would love to go. This is admittedly kind of a confusing icebreaker just because <laughs> so many of you are putting the location of your system in there. And I don't know if that's your vacation spot, but. Costa Rica, Alice. Yes, I studied abroad there actually. Loved it. It was a gorgeous place. Where'd you study abroad? San Jose. Okay, very nice. Yeah, beautiful. Got to get out of the like city the best, a couple times. <laughs> the best steak of my life there. Really? Like their <laughs> agriculture is really strong down there. And I always think about that steak. It's true, it's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, still have folks trickling in. I know a couple people had conflicts with the uh, meeting this month, but um, while we're waiting to get started here, we'll just wait another couple minutes. Um, please drop your name and your organization in the chat. That's how we take attendance. So if you're from a large system, please also provide the facility too, just so we can see who's joining us this morning. Um, and as you can see in the chat, lots of good vacation options are coming in hot. <laughs> Ooh, I have yet to go to Asia, but Japan is up there on my list. I would love to go someday. Nicole, I did not know that you lived in Hawaii for so long. That's awesome. Two good states. I miss it every day. My, my Facebook memories show a simpler time <laughs> in Hawaii. <laughs> Highly recommend if, if anyone wants to go, especially the big island and the volcano. It's very cool. Yeah, absolutely. I would definitely also be missing it. <laughs> Uh, a fact is the um, state of Hawaii, at least this was a couple years ago, it actually has the lowest rate of depression in the United States. So, Wow. I think part of it is that natural environment <laughs> and culture. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I see we hit the five minute mark. Um, but as we're going through today, please, um, if you're joining at any point, drop your name organization in the chat um, and your response to your favorite vacation spot. Today, uh, the Learning Collaborative, we have guests here from another amazing vacation spot, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, so I think they're all on this call today. Um, I think we have rounded up that crew, really looking forward to hearing what they have to say. Um, about their suicide care pathway. And um, as per usual, as we're going through the session today, 
please use the chat for any comments, questions as we move through. Um, we'll have some time set at the end for folks to ask questions as they come up, um, but we'll also be monitoring the chat to see um, what folks have to say. So I am going to turn it over to the fabulous crew from Philadelphia. Um, and I think Yesenia, you said you were gonna share screen. Uh, yes, I'll go ahead and do that now. Thank you. Can everyone see? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, well, thank you everyone um, and the Learning Collaborative for this opportunity. We're so grateful uh, for to be here today. Uh, and so we'll be presenting on our clinical pathway uh, for suicide care within a pediatric health care setting. And so in terms of uh, financial conflicts of interest, Drs. Soffer, Lewis, Lawrence, and myself uh, received funding from the Cardinal Health Foundation to help support suicide prevention quality improvement efforts within the, the institution. And so our team, uh, uh, three of us are here today, Dr. Soffer, Lewis, and myself. Uh, Dr. Lawrence uh, is a psychiatrist that's on our team and one of the founding members. Uh, in terms of pediatrics, Dr. Esposito and Dupnik uh, participate uh, thanks to the Cardinal Health Foundation and being able to expand our team. And our social work representative is Karen White within our organization. And so as you all may know, the Zero Suicide uh, framework offers a continuous quality improvement approach to suicide prevention. Um, it tries to close cracks in the system to provide safer suicide care. And there are seven core components that are outlined. Um, and that's what experts in the field indicate are really important points as integral components of safe care for individuals at risk of suicide. And they offer a holistic approach uh, to suicide prevention within health care and behavioral health care uh, systems. And there's the QR code um, to just get more information um, at your leisure. And uh, as far as the um, elements that we've been able to implement within uh, our organization to date are outlined on this slide and uh, we'll be going over them in more detail uh, through the course of the presentation. Uh, quickly, in terms of lead, Dr. Soffer, Lewis, and Lawrence uh, formed the Zero Suicide team and attended the Zero Suicide Academy in 2015. And we've also had a commitment from the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, that's our department, uh, the, the department chair, Dr. Tammy Benton, who also serves as our executive sponsor and our president and CEO uh, of, the, of the institution, Madeline Bell, uh, have expressed their commitment to suicide prevention improvement initiatives. We've been able to train over 450 CHOP clinicians and also um, trainees uh, in lectures uh, through COVID, pivoting to webinars, uh, and then also e-learning modules. Um, we've been able to also standardize suicide assessment and implement by, by implementing the CSSRS or Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale within our department um, back like, about five years ago and now um, trying to work on standardizing screening within our department and in other behavioral and behavioral health institutions that with regards to screening for suicide. In terms of ENGAGE, which uh, Dr. Stauffer and Dr. Lewis will talk more about today, uh, the Suicide Care Pathway was established uh, and launched in 2019 and members of our team, uh, along with other uh, members from various disciplines were able to develop a depression pathway uh, just last year. And in terms of IMPROVE, uh, we've been able to, uh, along with our electronic health record uh, team members, uh, create a dashboard for CSSRS data and uh, the Healthy Planet Population tool that Dr. Safa will talk more about towards the end of our time together. In terms of clinical pathway development, so variations in healthcare often do impact uh, the quality of care that our patients receive. And these variations exist for a variety of reasons, including a high amount of new medical knowledge and evidence from the research. Uh, our 
young people are growing in complexity in terms of the, the way in which they're presenting uh, to, our, to our offices or some systems of care, and also how we then manage that uh, and pair that with treatments that are recommended. And it also results from individual clinicians having their own practice styles and uh, based on their own clinical judgment, what works and what doesn't for their own um, practice. And so when we think of clinical practice guidelines, they are very helpful because they offer clear statements of what the recommendations are with regards to treatment. Uh, it's informed by a very robust review of the evidence, review of the literature, and they include the pros and cons of different, variant, of different treatment options, uh, depending on the presenting concern. They do have some limitations, including being very lengthy uh, and also not having a lot of specific details of what do I do in this particular situation with the young person or with a, a, an adult who's presenting in this kind of way. Uh, and it doesn't offer much information or guidance to help support uh, implementation of the clinical guidelines. And pathways help convert these guidelines into uh, what clinicians can do specifically for the patients that are in their care. And so the uh, clinical pathways offer this opportunity to narrow the gap between what the evidence, what the literature indicates are recommendations for treatment, how we're able to implement that into practice, and that uh, being then able to decrease the variation or eliminate the variation in um, the way in which we're able to care for, for the young people and, and adults that we see. And there's also room for making individual uh, decision making as, as a clinician. And so clinical pathways um, offer our very structured plans of care and a set of a recommendations that try to integrate evidence about clinical efficacy, perspectives of, of experts in the field, and what existing treatment guidelines are uh, to help develop standard of care recommendations for patients while at the same time decreasing variability in care across providers serving patients presenting with similar concerns or diagnoses. And all of this is done while taking into account the unique culture and environment of a healthcare institution. And guidelines can be applied across a continuum of care, and pathways do offer one or more specific treatment recommendations based on specific patient characteristics. And so some benefits of clinical pathways, uh, they help standardize care practice, which results in meaningful outcome metrics. Uh, for patients and individuals that we're serving in our various uh, healthcare organizations. It improves organizational efficiency in treating specific patient populations, and it can also help promote multidisciplinary collaboration and care coordination. Uh, it's focused on patient outcomes, and it can help ensure quality of care and offer a means of continuous quality improvement. And it also helps support training and education of current staff, those who are onboarding, and also those who will uh, become, you know, hopefully leaders uh, in, in the field as well uh, through our trainees. And so now I'll pass this over to Dr. Lewis, who will talk about the uh, outpatient specialty care clinical pathway for children and adolescents at risk for suicide. All right, great. Uh, thank you very much, um, Yesenia. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, more specifically about our clinical pathway. Uh, Dr. Maraquin did a really nice job of, of setting the framework for what pathways are, um, the purpose that they serve, um, you know, this bridge between, uh, you know, practice guidelines, which are often very high level, very um, comprehensive, detailed oriented sort of plans for care. Um, pathways are sort of the, the bridge between that and uh, individual decision-making. Um, it's sort of a, a, a distilled um, uh, clinical pathway. Um, yeah, a clinical pathway is sort of a distilled clinical guideline, um, which allows much easier sort of user access by an individual clinician. Um, here, actually, if you can go back one second, Dr. Maraquin, I would just like to highlight the QR code. Um, you can take a look at the clinical pathway um, as we are uh, discussing, uh, as we're talking today. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so um, specifically as it relates to our pathway, um, our goals are uh, you know, very focused on the, you know, the general standard goal of a clinical pathway, which is to standardize care practices and improve outcomes. Uh, so within that um, sort of overall framework, um, we were hoping to accomplish a few things when we uh, initially uh, set out to develop this pathway. Uh, first and foremost, um, we wanted to um, increase reliability of identification of suicidal ideation and behavior. Uh, what we learned during our process of standardizing um, our screening and risk assessment processes was that it was really important to have a shared language of suicidal ideation and behavior, uh, a shared sort of way to um, classify such thinking and actions. And so um, the pathway was sort of an extension of that. Um, often we wanted, also we wanted the pathway to um, provide guidance, um, sort of real-time guidance to clinicians in how to complete a suicide risk assessment, integrating uh, information about um, historical as well as recent and current ideation and behavior, uh, as well as risk and protective factors, both um, historical risk and protective factors, as well as sort of ongoing, um, uh, you know, risk and protective factors as well. Um, we also sought out uh, a goal of um, providing guidance on how this data, both from the suicidal inquiry, as well as from the risk assessment from risk and protective factors, how that data could be integrated uh, to develop a, uh, a risk formulation, as well as both near-term and long-term treatment plan considerations. Um, so there are lots of um, uh, intervention opportunities for, for youth at risk for suicide, uh, both uh, you know, short-term, such as safety planning, uh, as well as more longer-term um, options, such as suicide-specific treatment, whether it's DBT or CAMS or uh, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, for suicide risk. Um, so having um, a clear sort of pathway that can help a clinician know when these various different interventions are, um, are recommended um, was really important. Lastly, um, the fourth goal of the pathway was centered around uh, communication and really helping to support uh, communication across team members. Um, one of the things that Dr. Soffer will talk about at the end is how we have begun to integrate the pathway into our electronic health record. We use Epic at CHOP. Um, and uh, this really sort of satisfies that goal of uh, enhancing communication uh, amongst team members. So if I'm seeing a particular kid and that case is shared by a psychiatrist or has a pediatrician in our care network, um, communication about that suicide risk can easily be uh, transferred uh, across departments uh, and from one clinician to another that's treating that individual. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here is a screenshot of the top half of the pathway. Um, I just want to highlight uh, a few important uh, things here. Um, Dr. Soffer, uh, later in my talk as well as Dr. Soffer, will go into uh, more specific detail about some of the different sections, uh, but I just wanna sort of over, uh, you know, give an overview uh, and orient everyone to the pathway as a whole. So, uh, in typical pathway um, fashion, um, it's sort of hierarchical, um, working from top to bottom. So in looking at the main section, um, it starts off with sort of the, the patient population. So it helps uh, to identify what is the specific population that this particular pathway is um, geared towards. And so for this particular pathway, it's a patient with possible suicide risk. Um, and then it's gonna work through um, the various different steps of care, uh, starting with screening, when that screen is positive, moving down to a, uh, an assessment uh, that includes both uh, a suicidal inquiry uh, as well as an assessment of risk and protective factors, um, and then helping to um, differentiate um, individuals that are low acuity versus intermediate acuity versus high acuity of suicide risk. Uh, on the outsides, uh, both on the left and the right, you'll see uh, blue boxes, and that's where there is a significant amount of resources 
for, um, for providers, for patients, for families. Um, so we have community resources, we have provided resources, we have patient education. Uh, we also indicate the evidence base that um, was used to, to, to formulate the pathway. We have goals and metrics, as Dr. Marroquin mentioned, uh, a key aspect of clinical pathways is quality improvement. And so um, there's ongoing assessment of how the pathway is doing, and that assessment then feeds um, um, changes to the pathway and updates. Um, everything that's a blue hyperlink is, um, everything that's blue is a hyperlink that takes you to back page content, which we'll show uh, a little bit later on. And that is more detailed information about that uh, particular topic. So for example, under risk formulation, you'll see later that if you click that, it takes you to back page content, which discusses what risk formulation is and how to successfully engage in that process. Uh, next slide, please, Dr. Mack. So this is the bottom half of the front page of the pathway. So picking up on the top where individuals are differentiated into low, intermediate, or high acuity, you'll see that there are very specific de definitions for how those buckets get filled. Um, and um, what you'll notice is that uh, this first sort of determination of acuity is, um, is specifically based on the suicidal inquiry. So we have recommendations for um, uh, how an individual presents with their lifetime, recent or current uh, ideation or behavior uh, as determining whether they should be considered low, intermediate or high. So for example, an individual who has had wish for death in the past month or um, non-specific active SI, uh, active SI without, with methods but no intent, uh, or NSSI within the past three months, as well as no history of behavior would fall into the low acuity bucket um, versus the high acuity bucket would need to have at least one of the following. So within the past month, active SI with, plan, with some intent without plan or active SI with specific plan intent and or suicidal behavior in the past three months would place them in the high acuity. These definitions are definitions that come right from the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. So it's a standardized way of defining ideation and behavior. We then want to bring in the risk formulation, which includes risk and protective factors, but we also added something that's called red flags. So for us, red flags are more significant, uh, acute, um, variables that we want to a clinician to consider that would really sort of escalate um, a person's acuity level. Um, later on, we'll show you the back page content of red flags. But when you take, when a clinician takes that acuity, uh, excuse me, that, um, that suicidal inquiry data that leads to the acuity bucket and then adds in the risk formulation, it then leads to either standard care plan considerations or enhanced care plan considerations. So an individual in low acuity that has a um, certain amount of red flags that sort of escalate their, their acuity level or the concern that you may have would might maybe bump up to enhanced level versus um, an individual who's low acuity by, uh, by, uh, by, by, by their suicidal inquiry without these escalated risk and protective factors or red flags might be standard care plan considerations. And so in this bottom bucket, are um, what the care plan considerations for each of those categories then include, uh, including what should be done immediately, oftentimes psychoeducational tools, but then also safety planning uh, versus potentially uh, an evaluation in a crisis center or ED setting for the, the, the highest level of high acuity patients. And then more long-term care plan consider considerations, which are generally different types of uh, therapy options, whether they're sort of general behavioral health therapy, suicide specific therapy, uh, or medication management. Uh, can you go to the next page? Thank you, Dr. Marquin. So here are um, some examples of some of the back page content. So for example, uh, on the upper left is what would um, 
uh, what a clinician, what an individual would get on their screen if they clicked patient education. And so we have a listing of some PDFs that can be printed out and, um, you know, right there in that moment, uh, handed to a patient, uh, to an individual, uh, you know, a, a teen, a child, teen, or a parent. Um, bottom is what would uh, show up if you were to click risk formulation. So we sort of define what we mean by risk formulation. Uh, we indicate some different factors that may influence risk formulation, uh, such as, um, uh, you know, an inability to sort of maintain safety or engage in safety plan, uh, or the presence of red flags. So I, I mentioned red flags below. So these are sort of more acute risk factors. So including sort of a sudden change in their acuity of, of uh, suicidal ideation, significant decline in patient's mental status, dramatic worsening in patient's presentation or functioning. So those are sort of higher level risk factors that would um, really sort of cause a, a, a clinician to think about um, uh, you know, a, a higher level of acuity and a higher level of, of care plan considerations. Uh, next slide, please. We also have examples, uh, case examples embedded into the pathway um, to give a better sort of understanding of what we mean by uh, low acuity, intermediate acuity, and high acuity. Um, and we have, uh, here's an example of an intermediate acuity. Um, so we also break it down between what would be sort of standard care versus what would be enhanced care. So uh, Tommy and Brandon may have the same um, suicidal ideation and suicidal behavior presentation, uh, but they may have different risk and pro uh, protective factors, different red flag presentations, which would indicate that Tommy would be because of this sort of escalated, or excuse me, yeah, Tommy because of this escalated risk would be um, would benefit from enhanced treatment recommendations versus Brandon, which would, who would benefit from standard treatment recommendations, just to sort of give the individual uh, a better sense of, of how this sort of breakout happens for the different acuity levels. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the development of the pathway. Um, so uh, one of the things that I wanna highlight here is sort of the length of time. So we first submitted a proposal uh, to uh, the CHOP Office of Clinical Quality Improvement, OCQI, in April of 2017. Um, it was over a year later that the proposal was accepted. Uh, so it was quite a lengthy process. So um, uh, it, you know, it may work differently in different institutions, obviously, but you know, one of the highlights here is just the importance of kind of thinking ahead um, and giving yourself time to be able to develop uh, something such as a pathway. Uh, we then sort of met uh, over the next year, uh, about twice a week. We had meetings between our, our team, uh, which was really a multidisciplinary team, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, um, pediatricians, uh, QI folk. We had an improvement advisor, um, EPIC um, champion, uh, twice monthly meetings with that group to develop the pathway. And then ultimately the pathway was published in June, 2019. So this is uh, 2019. So this was this is published on our chop.edu website. There's a link below. If also, if you just Google chop suicide pathway, it'll be one of the first things that comes up. Um, and then the other thing that I wanna highlight is sort of the ongoing sort of um, uh, QI um, sort of improvement. This is a living document. So. Uh, we have revised this pathway multiple times since October, uh, and then again in June 2020. Um, and the way the pathways are set up is that they are more formally looked at every two, every three years. So actually in June 2020, 2022, um, we'll have a formal review process of the pathway, where I'm sure there will be more revisions at that time as well. Next slide, please. So one of the first things that we had to do uh, in the development of a pathway um, was benchmarking of existing pathways. Um, uh, what we learned early on, unfortunately, was that there was really not much uh, related to suicide care pathways for um, children or adolescents in an outpatient setting, which was really the, the treatment, the, the, the clinical population that we were setting out to work with. Um, 
we use a few different existing pathways, some of which are listed here um, as examples, but none of these are directly focused on uh, children and adolescents. So we were sort of embarking on a new, uh, a new area here. Um, but, um, but fortunately, we did have some uh, existing work to build upon. Um, I want to highlight uh, on the left, the Rocky Mountain. They have, a, they, they have a really fantastic pathway. And our takeaway from that one uh, uh, really helped us to kind of uh, formulate this idea of red flags because their pathway is um, sort of multidimensional in that it, it, it determines risk at, at, at the high intermediate low level, but it also breaks out each of those risk levels into acute versus chronic. Um, and that, you know, I think is really applicable for adults. Um, but there was takeaways from that that we wanted to think about um, for our population as well. And it helped us to kind of um, sort of develop this idea of standard versus enhanced recommendations. So thinking about the intermediate kid who's uh, sort of chronically at that level versus the kid who has more significant acute risk and needing enhanced level of care. Um, Institute of Family Health and Centerstone have really robust um, suicide um, management strategies as a whole. Um, and included in that are sort of care management plans, which we were also able to learn from. Uh, and then certainly the DBT literature um, from Marsha Linehan and her risk assessment and management protocol was really helpful as well. Um, but the key takeaway that we took from this, unfortunately, was that there's really very few pathways directed at youth at risk for suicide. And so we were um, you know, really hoping that this, that our particular pathway uh, can sort of fill that void. Next slide, please. Is it showing up? Um, it's not changing on mine. Zoom show. Is it looking? Is it back now? Uh, it's not. I have. Oh, there we go. Yes, got it. Perfect. Um, so after doing um, sort of benchmarking, benchmarking and literature review, uh, our next step was to think about the scope. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, ultimately the scope was outpatient behavioral health patients. So I have to um, so I have to share that when we first started this process, we um, had a larger scope. We were thinking about children being seen in the emergency department setting. We were thinking about including children being seen in a primary care setting by non-behavioral health clinicians, so by pediatricians. Um, for different reasons, ultimately, we decided to scale down the scope for this particular pathway and to really focus on outpatient behavioral health. We've since developed other pathways, uh, uh, specifically a depression pathway and an anxiety pathway that include primary care. For this one, though, we felt that it was best to focus just on um, outpatient seen by behavioral health clinicians. Um, we have a goal, uh, and we'll talk about it later, of expanding this pathway to include other populations. But for now, um, that was the scope. So our target population were patients with behavioral or emotional, health, health, emotional concerns or screening positive on a depression questionnaire, for example, PSU-9, patients with chronic or acute medical illness, patients who have had a decline in overall clinic behavioral or emotional functioning, who present with recent suicidal ideation or behavior, six and up, um, but again, being seen in an outpatient setting and being seen by a behavioral health provider. All right, so now I think I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Safer, who's gonna uh, finish up talking about pathway development and some next steps. Great, thanks, Jason. Thank you, Yesenia. And uh, once again, thank you so much for having us today. It's really great uh, to have this opportunity to share um, the development of our pathway uh, to, to your group. And uh, we, we, uh, we're really grateful to have to be here today. Um, so as uh, Dr. Lewis mentioned, uh, you know, he's given you like a, a nice overview of the pathway. We just want to zoom in on a couple of important aspects of the development of the pathway. Um, the first part is really coming up with all, all the definitions. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Lewis mentioned uh, when he was doing the overview of the pathway, all those 
uh, uh, blue hyperlinks that are available. Um, you know, defining, you know, at just kind of like taking a, a peek behind the process, uh, coming up with the content that pops up, if you will, when you uh, open those hyperlinks was, was a lot of work. And this is some of it. It was, uh, you know, really coming up with the, the definitions of different types of suicide ideation and behavior. Fortunately, we had a great resource uh, using the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, which is the uh, ass uh, assessment instrument that we use in our uh, behavioral health practices here at, at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, we also, you know, had to come up, you know, develop and look to the literature for definitions of, of, of screening assessment so we could provide guidance um, to, to people who would use the pathway. Um, the other thing to mention is that, you know, these pathways are, you know, although we're developing them here at, at CHOP, they, they are developed with the intent to be used widely um, uh, by other institutions or other, um, other organizations, because in essence, one of the purposes is to kind of share, uh, share an approach uh, to suicide risk assessment and uh, care planning with others so others can kind of use the information to, to look at their own practices and, and hopefully we're making a contribution in that manner. Um, uh, uh, the risk and protective factors. So Dr. Lewis uh, uh, thought about, you know, uh, focused on this a little bit when he was doing the overview. This was, to us is one of the real highlights of developing the care pathway is that we, you know, we'll, we'll go through it in, in, a, in, a, in a couple of slides, this risk formulation process and being able to provide people with the guidance of, you know, it's not as simple as just getting uh, results in the Columbia and saying, well, because you have this, we have, you know, we have to do, we have to take these steps. It really is taking the, the information you get from a, a standardized assessment measure, measure, then looking at the individual's presentation, uh, their, their individual risk factors, protective factors, what, what, the, what does their family bring, for example, what are, what are the other protective factors that they may have, and really looking at if there are any significant uh, red flag factors that may indicate that although their Columbia results is you know, something that maybe at the more the intermediate level, uh, they have certain red flags uh, that may indicate a, needing a higher degree of intervention uh, than you would normally think. Um, we also uh, you know, uh, wrote up a definition of risk formulation because we know, you know people would benefit uh, our own clinical team members as well as others from uh, some guidance about what does risk formulation mean and what's that process supposed to look like. Um, and then, uh, you know, looking to the literature and providing brief summaries of multiple intervention approaches, including uh, the safety planning intervention, uh, what, you know, definitions of active monitoring, and then uh, different suicide specific interventions that are appropriate for a child and adolescent population. And providing, uh, you know, basically quick summaries as well as links to resources so the user could learn more about that intervention approach, uh, including, you know, how to get training in it, for example. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, the, uh, one of the other things that we spend a lot of time uh, on is trying to identify how we would organize patients according to their acuity, uh, which we thought was a really important construct and concept to be able to have an organized care pathway. Um, so what you see in front of you now is uh, what we finally uh, developed um, but I, I, I don't know, we must have gone through 15 different iterations of this before we got to uh, what you're seeing now. Uh, really, you know, and that process was really, you know, looking at the, looking at CSSRS definitions uh, and then just taking multiple um, uh, opportunities to, to put them into categories and then really have a lot of internal debate among our team and then reaching out to other colleagues uh, to get their input so we really could come up with what made the most sense um, and trying to make these differentiations uh, into, uh, I think at one point we probably had four um, um, acuity categories and then narrowed it down to three. Um, the main purpose here is to help provide guidance about to the clinician or the user about an individual's level of need, and then taking that and matching it to recommendations about uh, treatment intensity, uh, which we really see as the key aspect of this care pathway is once you've identified the patient, level of need, what do you do next? And, you know, uh, you know, just taking a step back for a second, one of the main things that uh, really motivated us to come up with this care pathway uh, was the, the kind of feedback we were getting from our colleagues when we were providing them with training, education, and then guidance about using the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale as our 
standardized uh, suicide risk assessment instrument is uh, you know the, the the first thing that often came out of uh, first question we got when we provided training is well you know once we identify these patients now what do we do with them then um, and which I think is a probably a common thing that people hear when we start talking about you know more formalized screening and assessment um, so we really you know we really wanted to develop this uh, tool of a care pathway to provide be better guidance uh, to our to our colleagues and to others. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so then uh, we've, we've mentioned this a couple of times, the risk formulation. So again, this, is, this was a level, um, and if you can think back to the, to the overall picture, you know, first we have the acuity levels of the low, intermediate, and, and high. The next level down are these, um, these three boxes that you see at the bottom of the slide here, uh, which, which really uh, kind of guides the clinician or guides the user to kind of take a pause at this point um, you have, you now have your results of the, of your Columbia that you've administered. Now you have to take a pause and basically think about the individual's presentation and, uh, you know, your collect your, you know, kind of the other data that you may have about their, th themselves, their, their, uh, behavioral health symptoms, their behavioral health condition, what sorts of treatments do they have already? Um, what about their family situation, their social situation, their school situation? Do they have any red flags? Um, that you would want to integrate to then uh, either uh, keep them at a standard level of care or have to enhance their care based on escalating acuity. For example, a, you know, a, a teenager who may have significant suicide risk but is also actively using substances and their, their substance use is getting uh, somewhat out of control may be a reason to enhance their level of care in order to you know, uh, engage them into something that might be more responsive to their, their level of risk. Um, so, uh, thank you. Um, so, yeah, you can get, thank you. Um, so then that gets us to this, to this last, basically the last level, which is then matching uh, care plan considerations uh, with levels of risk. And uh, one thing to point out here is that you'll see on the, on this slide that there are four different categories of care plan considerations. That really is, be, you know, really due to using the, the risk formulation step to make a determination uh, is the is that our standard care plan considerations appropriate for this patient, or do we need to bump them up a level, if you will, to something that's more enhanced? Uh, so for patients at the the low acuity category, they may either have rec you know, the recommendations may be standard care plan considerations such as psychoeducation and active monitoring, so at the low acuity standard care, or if there are some red flags, uh, although their Columbia results may indicate. Um, that they're at a low acuity level, if they have red flags or other factors that may uh, indicate needing more enhanced care, uh, there's the flexibility to then uh, utilize or, or get recommendations that might include uh, you know, a high level of, of care, such as uh, formalized safety planning or engaging in more formal uh, outpatient therapy or a referral to a psychiatrist or another physician for uh, medication management. Uh, likewise, on the higher end, you know, uh, for high level acuity, uh, patients uh, may, uh, if, they, if, if they're at the standard care level, uh, there's gonna be safety planning and psychoeducation, uh, and then uh, recommendations to, to have more suicide focused care, uh, specific evidence-based care focusing on suicide uh, risks such as uh, DBT uh, or uh, uh, suicide focused cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, or considering higher levels of care out, you know, beyond our patients such as uh, uh, intensive outpatient or partial hospital programs. But if their level of acuity is even greater, uh, we would make you know, the guidance is to then get them to a crisis level evaluation to see if they uh, may need uh, inpatient hospitalization. Okay, so that, that's really hopefully gives you a good overview of, of the process and, and the work that went into the development. Um, since we've, uh, since we've uh, had the opportunity to, to publish the pathway in June, 2019, uh, uh, these, are, these are kind of some of our usage stats. Um, so there's been over 12,000 unique page views from over uh, 5,000 users. Um, it's garnered interest across the United States, um, uh, as well as internationally, um, uh, our colleagues are, um, in, in some international organizations. Uh, we were also really pleased uh, when the Zero Suicide Institute uh, asked us if they could include as part of one of their resources in the engage, tool, engage component of the toolkit, 
um, we were, you know, really, uh, that's one of the purposes is to be able to share it with others, uh, especially since what Dr. Lewis uh, indicated that there really are not that many uh, uh, resources focused on the needs of children and youth. Um, Dr. Maraquin mentioned earlier that it's really been a great teaching and training tool. So every year we do uh, training uh, for our new uh, trainees coming into our department across the multiple disciplines that we provide training to, psychiatry, psychology, social work, nurse practitioners. We've also been able to use this as a resource uh, for our, our colleagues in uh, pediatrics, both primary care and specialty medical care. Um, we've had the opportunity to share this via a couple of Grand Rounds presentations um, at our, uh, within our organization, including uh, just last week in our Department of Pediatrics. Um, so we're going to go on to some, uh, some lessons learned about this. Um, so, you know, as Dr. Lewis alluded to earlier, you know, this is a long process. Um, it took us, you know, well over a year of meetings. It was a big time commitment on behalf of the work group um, and, you know, the meetings and then all the work between the meetings. So, you know, we would really want people to be prepared about the degree of commitment that it takes of time and resources uh, to develop a care pathway and to get, get a product like we're showing you today. Uh, it was also really important to include a multidisciplinary team so we could get the input of uh, people and make the care pathway as relevant as possible across different care settings. Although we really are uh, seeking to make it uh, to make it apply to other settings as well. Uh, project management support, it was really important to have kind of that person who kept us organized, established goals, kept us on time. Uh, you know, kind of that, that person that keeps prodding you to say, hey, you know, the deadline for getting this component back is this, or we need the answers for these questions. Uh, to keep the process moving forward uh, because everybody you know has so many different things that they do in their roles that we wanted to make sure that you know we had someone who's keeping us focused on making sure this uh, move forward um, we're fortunate to work in an organization that has a web design team that focuses on clinical pathways so you know we have a whole clinical pathways program that we were able to work with um, so they're very accustomed to taking uh, a word document which is what we develop and then translating it to something that looks great on the internet with all the hyperlinks um, and then really focusing on communication, uh, you know, uh, communicating out to our colleagues, doing roadshows. So we had multiple times when we went to meetings of, uh, of within our department and outside our department to share this as a resource uh, to make sure our colleagues knew uh, it's available and you know, really uh, to fill one of its main purposes, which is imagining our one of our colleagues who may not come across patients with suicide risk all that often, but when they do, we want them to know that there's a resource there for them to provide them with good guidance to help their clinical decision-making. Um, so now, you know, uh, our next steps now we have it is, uh, you know, going to uh, meetings with organizations such as, your, such as yours to, uh, who have similar interests to help engage in your own care pathway work um, and use this as a resource. And, and so we, we welcome you to do so and welcome you to follow up with us if, if you're interested. Um, we, you know, continuing to revise it. It's a living document, as Dr. Lewis mentioned. So we, we, we go back and make changes to it based on feedback or new, new information. Uh, we're certainly hoping to, we're, we're uh, not hoping, we're working to adapt it to other care settings within our organization to make it more applicable to places with uh, unique needs, such as primary care or emergency department. Um, and then uh, really now focusing on getting it embedded in our uh, uh, electronic health record, uh, EPIC, because uh, the real goal here is to make it a kind of a living resource uh, that a clinician or, or someone or another member of the team working with a patient or family uh, has just in time support uh, to identify patients at risk, because uh, that's a big component here. And then the, the support for clinical decision making without having to go outside of the medical record, which we know is challenging for uh, our, our frontline clinicians to get that support. We want it to be baked in to the electronic uh, health record. So one of the ways we're doing that is this project uh, that we've been working on for about a, a year or so called Healthy Planet. Uh, Healthy Planet is a population uh, uh, health uh, tool, set of tools that are part of the, Epic, the suite of EPIC resources that uh, organizations who use EPIC are able to access. And really is focusing on using population level data to, monitor, to more actively monitor patients and provide guidance to clinicians and other members of the healthcare team. Um, it it uh, helps you build uh, patient registries uh, which auto refresh based on information that uh, it takes from the electronic medical record uh, to basically, and you build the algorithm to say, these are the patients I want on my registry um, to, to be able to monitor based on the diagnosis. In our case, it would be, you know, elevated suicide risk and basically 
translating the care pathway into these epic based tools. So then we have our population defined. Um, so our members of our clinical team and nursing team, our social work team are more aware of our patients and making sure they're engaged in care um, and you know, getting the appropriate level of care. Um, also provides with a better opportunity to gather data in a more systematic way so we can track and you know, track our improvement efforts over time to make adjustments as necessary and to see if we're reaching our goals for our patient population. So our, our two major goals for uh, this healthy, these healthy planner tools are uh, A, to develop uh, a process and implement a process for identifying high-risk patients uh, who would qualify for our care pathway to ensure that they're getting the appropriate degree of treatment intensity to address their need uh, to more uh, closely monitor our patient population, in essence, close the gaps in care. Uh, so we don't miss, you know, so patients who may have difficulties or barriers with attending appointments aren't going to get lost in the system, so to speak, uh, because th these are the last patients we want that to happen to. Um, and then make sure that uh, we are more uh, actively and proactively identifying patients that may have changes in status and prompting the clinician or members of the team to consider uh, higher levels of care really to prevent emergencies. And, and you know, I'm sure in your area, much like our area, our, our, our emergency rooms are overwhelmed at this point. Uh, so you know, giving patients different levels of different, uh, more responsive care to keep them out of the emergency room is really important at this point. Um, we also hope to use the, the, the data to better understand our, our level of acuity across our patient caseloads uh, to make, you know, to, to at, a, at a program level, to support decision making regarding recruitment of new staff, making sure clinician caseloads are appropriate to prevent burnout, and then develop new clinical services and programs to be more responsive to our patients' needs. And I think that's our, our last slide. Hopefully, we've left a few, it looks like we left a few minutes for questions. Just want to you know, thank the whole team. Uh, so today it's uh, Dr. Lewis, Dr. Maraquin, and I. We have uh, Dr. Lawrence as one of our core team members. Um, along with uh, Drs. Dupnik and Esposito. And then uh, we always want to express our thanks to uh, Dr. Benton, who's our executive uh, sponsor and our department chair and the chief psychiatrist here, uh, has been uh, very, really supportive of our work throughout. So we're happy to take uh, questions, of course. I guess people can either put them in the chat or I guess take themselves off mute and ask. Yeah, either works. Just going to hold some space here for questions. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, really amazing work that you've done over there with the whole pathway near leadership and sharing it out elsewhere too. That's awesome. I know I'm going to spend some time pouring through those links and um, we will be sending out the recording and slides afterward too for folks. So if they have questions, they might reach out afterwards too. But if anyone has anything, feel free. And uh, I just like that, you know, Conlin has our, our contact information, our email addresses. So, if, you know, I, it's perfectly fine, Conlin, if anybody asks, if people want to get in touch with us, uh, happy to, you know, to consult or, you know, provide some guidance on this. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. I've never been to Colorado, but I understand it's a great vacation destination. So maybe one day. It is. Lots of good spots. Look over the chat. A lot of people put in some good recs in there. <laughs> All right. I do have a question about um, clients getting off of the care pathway. And so what's been successful on your end on once clients are no longer at risk that they that you have a process in place for that clinical judgment where they don't just get stuck for eternity? You'll have to invite us back next year for that one. It's what we're working on it right now. It's a great question. Um, we, from the beginning, knew that we wanted to think about ways to get individuals on the pathway. I'll add that an additional piece to that is one of the things that we have already embedded into Epic, into our electronic health record, is that when certain um, le certain types of ideation and certain types of suicidal behavior are indicated that clinicians are prompted to add specific problems to the problem list. So that's like another way that, uh, you know, individuals are getting on the pathway for lack of a better word. Um, but we're now in the process of thinking about how to transition things like, 
you know, one of the problems might be suicidal ideation, how to translate, how to transfer that to history of suicidal ideation, and that, and then how to eventually take that off the problem list, or just using the pathway as an example, how to get kids uh, on the pathway and then get kids off the pathway. So it's still something that we're working on right now. Um, and uh, we hope to, you know, have, have that active soon. Yeah, just to, just to build off Jason's uh, answer, you know, the, it's one of the other uh, benefits of this healthy planet um, tool is that it's allowing us to come up with some definitions for, you know, as, as X amount of months pass and, uh, you're, you know, the patient's no longer endorsing uh, suicidal ideation or behavior, it would then provide a prompt that this patient is no longer, you know, el, you know no longer should be on the pathway, uh, which is something we currently don't have. So it will build in some clini clinician guidance, if you will, uh, when patients have improved enough. Got it. Yeah, because we are working, we're, we're the mental health center in, in three counties in Colorado. And so um, we are working on developing a safer suicide care pathway this year. And that's one of the things is we've had various things to flag high risk clients over the years, but they become um, unimportant over time because nobody manages the cleanup of ensuring that it's accurate data of who is risky and who isn't. And so I'd um, love to kind of connect a year from now to see yeah. what's working for you guys and see what's potentially working for us as well. That sounds great. Yeah, so we understand the, the, the issue. Um, awesome. I see a question in the chat. Um, uh, uh, thank you for the kudos. Um, we actually don't have a inpatient facility. Um, at this point, it is uh, something that's under development, but uh, CHOP doesn't have an inpatient psychiatric uh, unit uh, right now. Um, so, uh, but it, you know, we do have, we, we, we have inpatient medical units, but not an inpatient psychiatric unit. So they, uh, we don't really have an application for this pathway at an inpatient level. Um, again, you know, I think, one, I think one of the approaches we took here is that once you build one, um, adapting it to different settings be, hopefully becomes easier than starting from scratch. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of the process that we're starting to go to now is thinking about how do we take this and apply it to a primary care setting? Cause you know, our institution has a very robust primary care network. Um, so that, that definitely a need that we have. Awesome. Thank you for catching that question in the chat. Um, we're getting towards the end of our hour here. So I'm going to, share some OSP updates, but wanted to express thanks to the CHOP folks one more time. That was really, really helpful. Um, I know folks will be looking forward to watching the recording and accessing those slides afterwards. So thank you very much. Um, thank you for having us, really appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. thank you, thank you. Um, last couple roundup of things, just wanna flag the Zero Suicide Toolkit, the resources available on the national website, available at that link. The CDC released um, a request for public input from healthcare professionals talking about work-related stress. So opportunity to weigh in there due November 26th. Um, the three following organizations are providing free trainings and resources. So please feel free to check out those links by clicking through the slides afterwards. And um, just got noticed this morning actually that I Matter Colorado, the um, organization is offering three free counseling sessions for all youth in the state um, from now on, usually telehealth, but um, please feel free to access that, learn more about that org and what they're doing. Um, our resources we share every meeting flagged here, and our next meeting will be a little earlier than the fourth Thursday of the month, likely at uh, 12 p.m. on November 15th, a Monday, and we'll be talking about military and veteran culturally competent care, screening questions, and referrals. So thank you very, very much for joining us today. Again, really appreciate the folks from Philadelphia sharing their experience with zero suicide and otherwise looking forward to seeing you at the next one. Thanks everyone.